Hospitals are working to improve the patient experience by developing a simpler, more accessible approach to billing. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly with AHA Communications. The AHA is developing tools to help hospitals create a better billing experience for their patients. We will continue to highlight how hospitals are successfully doing this work and share resources designed to help hospitals implement the AHA patient billing guidelines, including issues around financial assistance and collections practices. In this Members in Action podcast, Julia Resnick, Director of Strategic Initiatives at the AHA, is speaking with Scott Howig, Chief Financial and Chief Administrative Officer, and Paul Spencer, Vice President of Managed Care and Revenue Cycle, to learn how Freighted in Wisconsin is consolidating bills from across the continuum of care to make the process more patient-friendly. And now to Julia. Hello, I'm Julia Resnick from the American Hospital Association. Today's podcast is part of the Value Initiatives Members in Action series. We are highlighting how hospitals are improving value and affordability for their patients and communities. These members have implemented strategies that improve outcomes, enhance the patient experience, and lower cost. Joining me today are two leaders from Freighter in Wisconsin, Scott Howig, Chief Financial and Chief Administrative Officer, and Paul Spencer, Vice President of Managed Care and Revenue Cycle. We will be discussing how they've changed their billing approach to make it more accessible and comprehensible to patients. I'm so glad to be talking with you both today. Let's jump right in. So it would be really great to start with some background on Freighter. Can you talk about why there was a need to change how you're billing your patients? Sure. Thanks for having us, Julie. It's great to be with you. As it relates to billing the patients, I think you know, we're on a journey like a lot of different health systems to try to improve the patient experience. And the billing experience is a big part of patient experience. We get a lot of feedback as it relates to billing. And I think that we do a good job with billing, but healthcare billing in general, I think definitely has room for improvement. For people that have insurance, there's always three parties involved. There's the insurance company, the provider, and then the patient himself or herself. And so, That whole process with getting an EOB, understanding how much you owe when insurance is paid, waiting for the insurance to pay is is very complicated, very time consuming, and it's not easy for patients to really make sense out of it. Our thought was to, you know, obviously we're on a journey to try to improve the patient experience. One of the things that we've really tried to do as it relates to that is to try to send out a more friendly patient bill when we do bill the patient. And one thing we've noticed early on is that there were people getting different bills from different providers, even within our health system. And one of the main reasons for that is because we are very closely aligned with our academic medical partner, the Medical College of Wisconsin, which is technically a separate organization from Freighter Health. And we knew right away, I mean, we've known for a while that we wanted to be able to put on the patient statement consolidated charges from both of us to make sure that the patient really understood that they owed Freighter and the medical college, you know, a certain amount of money. And there's lots of reasons why consolidating that statement has value to the patient. We can go into some of that, but that's actually as as, as simple as that sounds. There's actually a lot of background work that has to go into making sure that we can put all of those charges from different providers onto a consolidated statement. And so we knew that was our goal. We knew that there were a lot of value to doing that. That's been something that I think we could focus on and, and is, is part of you know, our journey to improve the patient experience. Yeah, and I, and I can add to that. Paul talked kind of about a lot of the work and, and tactically what we were doing. Additionally, the healthcare industry is a metrics-driven industry. And we use that data to, to your, the point of your question, how do we know it was a problem? We use that data to help figure out what aspects to look at. And and when you look at the healthcare process or the hospital and medical practice process, the billing process for all the reasons Paul mentioned is one of the less satisfaction oriented processes that we have. Mm -hmm. And so we commissioned a study and participated in a community study that polled our community, not just freighter patients, 
about their healthcare experiences and specifically around their scheduling and billing experiences. And we got feedback on how we perform versus the competition in our market. And then also we're able to compare that to regional and national data. And largely around this concept of a net promoter score, we were able to figure out for our billing process, how did we compare to the competition? Well, that showed that we compared favorably. We were a high performer. That high performing NPS score was still much lower than our clinical score. So people came in and and we are a high patient satisfaction orientated system. People came in and they love and score very highly our clinical care. And relatively speaking, our billing and scheduling score was high, but not at the level of our clinical score. And so for Paul and I, that was just kind of a point right in our face that says we have an opportunity there to be as good administratively as we are clinically. That's great. So so once you knew that, what did you do? What changes did you make? Yeah, so part of it was was getting with our partners, like like I mentioned, the medical college. And saying that we we want to let's let's talk about the consolidated statement. We want to be able to offer this to our patients. We think it's worth doing, and let's work out the mechanics and the logistics of how we're going to do that. And in order to do that, you have to think through all these different scenarios. And I don't want to get too deep into it, but if you think about it this way, when you consolidate all of a statement and then you send that out, and you get short paid by the patient and they don't pay the full balance, who gets paid first? Is it the oldest balance that gets paid first? Is it the hospital that has the largest balance that gets paid first? And then the physician gets paid later? How do you split those payments and what's the mechanics in terms of the the banking structure in the background to do that? Whose lockbox do you use? The hospital's lockbox, the physician group's lockbox? How do you move money back and forth between the two different entities? Those are things that the patient doesn't understand and we would never want them to try to understand or have to deal with because it's all inside baseball stuff. There's a lot of work that goes into that. We realized that as an Epic shop, we really needed to implement the Epic single business office functionality to make some of this work. And so the the Epic SBO or single business office essentially is a module within Epic that makes all this patient-friendly billing work. We're committed to moving down that path of continuing to turn on all of the different things that the SBO offers. Part of doing that, if we, we, we needed that to coincide with the overall billing strategy of our other partners who had to agree to use Epic in that way, who might be using a different billing system. So our partners sunset their legacy system, moved on to our instance of Epic, and that's been a real game changer for us is to unlock the power that Epic has. Again, I mentioned journey. That's our journey is to continue to move down the path of using the Epic functionality. As, as an example, we use a vendor for our patient statements and the vendor is good, but we think that we could use the native Epic functionality to print statements directly out of Epic and that we will not need that vendor to do that pretty soon. So we are moving down the path of turning that on and, and I mentioned some of the benefits earlier of, of doing this. By using the SBO and having everything into a common instance of Epic, we can now use the MyChart functionality, which is the patient-facing software in Epic, to allow patients to see all of their balances, to pay them online, if they want to consolidate different amounts that they owe with us, different balances, they can do that. If they want to get on a payment plan or consolidate payment plans, they can do that. That's going to be really a focus of us for the next few years because we have a couple entities that are still not on the SBO yet. We own a reference lab, for example, that is going to come into the SBO next year. And then we will be able to put all of the reference lab charges and and balances onto our consolidated statement. So some of this, the patients don't really see. They might not even know that that reference lab is wholly owned by Freighter because it's branded differently. But we do think it'll be a value when we can put all of those charges onto our statement and then again roll that patient up into its payment into a payment plan, do do the my chart functionality. So there's a lot of back office work that needs to make this work, and that's what we're focused on. And I I would add when you do what Paul said, right? So you start to use the system to consolidate the information you know and have on a patient and you give them a platform to interact themselves, whether he he mentions kind of setting up a payment plan themselves or kind of changing their insurance information themselves, 
I think what we found is once we have that information consolidated and see how people are using it, it then opens up two more doors, one of those being policy. So it, it gave us an opportunity to then look at our policies around payment plans. Where should we set limits? How much duration should we give? And we were, to your point of what did we do as next steps, we started to look at our policies and how people were kind of engaging with us. And we adjusted our financial assistance policy and we adjusted our payment plan policy largely based on or coming out of the work that Paul did. So I'd say policy is another spoke to this. And then lastly, technology has been a big part of it. Part of it, as we've talked a lot about, is Epic and what you can do in a single business office. But then again, once you've got people starting to engage with that, you can go above and beyond Epic into texting, loading into whatever e-bank system they may use in terms of how they get their other invoices, their utility invoices and, and things like that as well as automated calls and transactions. And so you can start to, I'll say, as we start to gather this patient relational database, we see how they're using us and accessing us. We can start to engage them more in the form, format that they prefer. That's great. So we've been talking a lot about you know, what it takes on the back end to get this running. Can you walk me through what the patient's experience is like nowadays with the billing process? I wouldn't want to tell you that it's wildly different than than it currently or that it was or that we've solved everything. There's still the confusion of getting an EOB from the patient, wondering if they should pay that or not or wait and what that means. There's still getting the statement and making sure it reconciles with the EOB. And we definitely see patients that wait a, a period of time for that to get paid faster. I think we have put in place some things that will allow us to accelerate where we want to go even faster. And that if we didn't put an SBO in place, for example, we wouldn't be able to do the things like through the phone, through texting that Scott had described, because we wouldn't have that connectivity with the patient, like through my chart, and we wouldn't be able to do some of those really cool patient facing things. So I'd say that we're still kind of in the beginning of our journey, but we definitely have a roadmap of where we want to go. And it is built on, you know, the foundation of using our systems to its fullest capability, not being dependent on different vendors and piecing things together for us in a way that we can't control. We want to be able to control as much as we can control in the experience and not have to rely on a vendor to do that. So those are some of the things that we're, that we're really happy about in terms of what we've done so far. Yeah, I, I would just reemphasize the, the part Paul mentioned. If you look at the core complaints, Everything we've talked about thus far is really focused on making the bill, the actual receipt of the bill and reading, understanding of the bill easier. And you could argue it was really bad before and we got it up to average now in terms of improvement. So we've worked hard on putting it in language that's more understandable, mm -hmm. right? So, so five or 10 years ago, arguably we used very healthcare technical language still in these invoices or bills that went out, in addition to sending multiple, one from the hospital, one from the physician. So we, I'd say we've come a long way in tackling the first or the low hanging fruit pain points in the billing experience. To your question and to Paul's point of saying we're not at the end of the road yet, we'll talk more about that EOB when we talk about the grand vision in the future. But I, I think probably the pain point today that we've done work on, but probably isn't to where we want it to be yet is the, the estimate. It's one thing to give you a bill that you understand and can read and includes all the service that you received from us on that day, whether it was the physician, the lab or the hospital. It's another thing to come in that day as you walk in knowing what that's going to be or at least having a reasonable range of what that's going to be. And so many of us in the industry and we're, we're right aligned with that have uh, built and turned on our own estimates that try to gauge where you are in your deductible and your co-insurance provisions and copay provisions and whatever insurance you may have. But getting broader usage of that, as well as getting that more and more accurate, still is a goal to chase. And that in partnership with a much easier and what under uh, easier to understand bill is I'll say maybe the golden chalice that we're chasing here at the moment. Yeah, we stood up, Julia, we stood up uh, and a pretty robust, I think, estimation team that can provide estimates to our patients for all services, physician, hospital, ancillary, et cetera. And we found they're pretty accurate. But as Scott said, what we've found is that the uptake on people calling or requesting 
the estimates. It's still not where we probably thought it would be. We're doing what I would call a more reactive estimate, where we provide any estimate for any patient when they ask us for one. Where we know we can still improve is even when they don't ask us for one, sending them a proactive estimate before they come in and saying, this is how much we think that your visit is going to be. And then, of course, the logical thing is to then tie that into easy ways to make those payments. That's where we still need to go in the future is getting the people that information up front so there's no surprises on the back end and they know exactly where they're going to be. Those are, those are two sides of the same coin and both really important. So I know we talked at the beginning that you knew that this was an issue from your patient satisfaction surveys. So what, since you've started on this journey, have you seen what the impact has been on patient satisfaction or anything else related to outcomes or cost? We liked the assessment or, or thought the, the first assessment was so informative that we turned it into every other year type of assessment to your question. So how do we follow up as a way to gauge our improvement? We have seen as part of that Again, community-based survey, we have seen our scores increase. Again, probably not to the level yet clinically where we want to be, which is our ultimate target. But from our baseline assessment of a number of years ago, we have seen improvement as a result of the things exactly that we're talking about. I would say, you know, in terms of the cost, I would just say a lot of the reasons why we're doing this is it's not that it's going to necessarily improve our bottom line immediately, particularly putting out more patient-friendly balances and statements, you would think that would improve the level of payment rate that we get. But we started in a really pretty good spot before we entered that journey. So being where we are in Wisconsin, I think Midwestern people, for the most part, pay their bills. And if they owe something, they pay it. So we started in a good spot there. And we didn't really see, I would say, a noticeable improvement in terms of the bill pay, because again, it was making it more friendly and more easy to understand. Mm -hmm. I do think, though, that when we start really moving down the path of providing more proactive estimates and start trying to get the cash more upfront, as opposed to waiting even for the statement to go out, we'll see some uptick there, certainly. But even there, we're not in a bad spot. I mean, our collections numbers are very strong. I think Scott would agree. I think we're doing this more because we want to make our patients happy. And, and satisfied with us, not so much because we see this huge financial gain from doing it. That's great. So what have you learned over the course of implementing this new patient billing approach that other hospitals could learn from? I think a couple of things. So we, about three years ago, maybe four, we created a position called the Director of Patient Financial Engagement. And so we have a position in Revenue Cycle who's job really is to think about the financial engagement situation of our patients and to have an eye towards improving that in everything that we do. So I think that's been really invaluable in terms of standing up our estimates, implementing best practices in terms of how you engage financially with your patients. We've turned those on. So I think that one of the things is you need to have a focus on wanting to do this and why are you doing this as opposed to just the business as usual sort of status quo. And then I think the other thing is, I would say, don't underestimate some of the back office lifting you'll have to do from a systems perspective to turn on some of these things. Make sure you have the IT resources lined up to do that, because everything we do now, I think, touches technology in some way. And, you know, the other thing we're really trying to do is automate more of the things that we do that now take manual intervention. So, we're going to, I think, become more efficient and get better using technology. So don't underestimate, I would say, the resources that will be required to do that and the help you're going to need from different people within the health system to make some of these things that you think are just revenue cycle things work. And I would say with all the technology capabilities we have today and that continue to come in terms of ways to pay, ways to self-direct patients, way to get them engaged, the primary frustration, I think, on the billing process continues to be multiple confusing bills. And so I, I would echo what Paul mentioned earlier in terms of being ruthlessly aggressive about consolidating your billing activity into a single business office. So Paul mentioned we consolidated our hospitals onto a st single statement. Then we took the physician practices that we work with and added them to that statement. Now we're adding 
our outreach lab, but there's more to come, right? So all of us health systems across the country have relationships for dialysis or ambulatory surgery center relationships or standalone imaging relationships or all the different types of business units we run. If we just stop at consolidating our hospitals and physicians, there will continue to be frustration from our patients that say, okay, you you got me 60 or 70% of the way there, but remind me again why you still send that lab bill separate. And to Paul's point, I have to check the EOB for that. I have to add the copays and deductibles from all these pieces of paper or text or whatever it may be you send. So I think we have so many great technology tools ahead of us and ways to engage the patient ahead of us. We need to present the total healthcare picture as the patient sees it to them. If we continue to allow some of these, albeit smaller pieces, to be hanging chads, I think we will continue to have an uphill battle because we'll continue to be confusing by having multiple statements go out. Absolutely. It is certainly a journey, and I, I think you're starting to get at this, but what what's next for Freighter in this space? Sure. I, I, I'll take the first one. I, there's just two of them, and I, and I can't help myself because Paul mentioned it earlier with the EOB, and, and I think, and, and we'll use this question as further down the line. We kind of touched on things that are in the mm-hmm. next year or two, but if you go further than that, that concept of an EOB is When can we get to a point when the piece of paper that the insurance company sends the the patient and the bill that we send say the same thing? The opportunity to reduce frustration by the patient, certainly, and phone calls to both of us, both the payer and the provider, is just a huge opportunity. And So that's one that we're focused on that we've dabbled with in terms of a health plan that we own a part of and some TPAs that we own a part of. How can we create that one-stop shopping as it relates from an EOB and a statement. Mm-hmm. I think longer term, uh, given kind of the disparity in the market and the number of health plans and Medicare and Medicaid programs we work with, that's a longer term objective. But I agree with Paul, that's that's a big frustration and, and one that seems like we should be able to tackle in today's day and age. So I'd say that. And then can't help myself but to talk about technology and innovation and where that's going. Certainly around this idea of a contactless communication center, more of an education resource center for patients to self-direct them to whether it's self-setting a patient payment plan, checking their lab results, paying any of the invoices that we kind of just covered from any of the different care settings without Mm -hmm. having to call us, without having to, quite frankly, even text back and forth pay in the format that they choose, whether that's uh, Apple Pay or a credit card or what may it be. That idea that we give kind of a self-direction center, likely including estimate. You know, what was the estimate you had before? How would we lift up that estimate? I think is is critical. That's probably intermediate term, right? It's a little bit closer at hand. Paul, anything you would say in terms of uh, where we're headed? Yeah, I, I would agree with everything you said there, Scott. And I know we're talking about the back end. So I do think on the back end, when you're dealing with a lot of transactions and you think about any health system, 99.9% of the transactions go correctly, but that 0.1% when you're dealing with millions of transactions is a large volume that someone has to deal with. I think the way to reduce errors in the back end is to continue to, to automate and to have as few manual touches as possible. And we're on that journey of trying to automate more things using robotic processing technology to do some things that people do. That that way, I think you can redirect your force, your your workforce to do more patient solving tasks as opposed to more repetitive tasks related to billing. So I think that's a that's a real opportunity for us because when something goes wrong in the back end and you, and it takes two or three people to jump in to fix it, it's just because something didn't process correctly often. And and reducing that error is the key to improving the patient experience. Just having an error-free billing process, for example, then, then then what you would focus on is just how can I make all the interfaces with the patient, as Scott described, as wonderful as possible. That's all great to hear and sounds like you're really going in the right direction. So thank you, Scott and Paul, for joining me today and sharing this really important work that you're doing. And then we really look forward to hearing how this work continues to grow in the future. This has been an excellent example of how hospitals can enhance the patient experience to improve value. So for more podcasts and resources to help you promote value in your community, 
please visit the Value Initiatives website at www.aha.org slash the Value Initiative. That is it for today, and thank you all for listening.